question for you. So how do you plan on getting all the household chores done while you're postpartum? Oh, and also, do you have a therapist appointment on the calendar for that time? Oh, and finally, have you thought about when are family and friends allowed to visit? And do you require them to be vaccinated, wear a mask? All of these questions and many, many more need to be addressed before you're in the depths of your postpartum experience. And the best way to do that is by creating an actual postpartum plan. Today's guest, Jessica Argenio Waller, was not fully prepared for the ups and downs that come in that first month of being postpartum. As the senior health and wellness editor for Motherly Now, Jessica has a completely new perspective, and she's here to share with us what she wishes she had done differently. Learn her number one recommendation for support in postpartum, along with the eight topics that you need to cover in order to physically create your postpartum plan. While we never can fully be ready for the roller coaster that we're about to go on, by the end of this episode, I promise you'll be better equipped to experience a smooth transition into and through postpartum. You are listening to the Mamas in Training podcast giving aspiring and expecting moms guidance and community from moms who have been there. And I'm your host, Jessica Lorian. An autoimmune disease is delaying my journey into motherhood. So while I heal from that, I've decided to learn all about motherhood before I actually am one. So we get to go on this journey together. Listen along as we learn today how to create our postpartum plan. And now on to the show. I knew that I wanted to have a baby in, it was like the end of 2015. And I wasn't sure how that was going to work out exactly, but I've always been kind of a planner. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to sit down with my notebook. Me too. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to try to figure, map it all out. So it makes sense on paper and then maybe it'll happen in real life, which, you know, never actually works out that way, (laughs) but you can try. So I was working full time for a magazine. I knew I wanted to take a break from that and go pursue a nutrition degree in clinical nutrition, a master's of science in grad school. This was all pre-COVID, so it was kind of new to have like an accessible online program, which I was like, oh, that'd be mm. super flexible. If I get pregnant, I could, you know, be home and take classes at home. Um, and maybe it's like the perfect time to make that work because, you know, there's never really ever a perfect time to get pregnant and have a baby. So I stepped back from my my magazine job, I took a two week maybe trip to Europe with my husband over Christmas. And then we're like, when we get back in January, we're going to start trying to conceive. And at that point, I was nannying. Also, I'd started to take on some nannying work and still doing some freelance work here and there and grad school. So I was juggling a lot of different things. We got pregnant fairly quickly, which was very lucky. I did a ton of research during pregnancy. I read a bunch of books. I took a birth class, which was incredible. I toured the hospital. I had started to plan like, okay, I'll take a couple weeks off of my grad school classes around the time of the birth and pause my freelance work for a little bit. But because I wasn't working full time anywhere and because I didn't have you know benefits, it was all unpaid leave. So I didn't feel like I could take a ton of time off around that. But my husband and I, he was working at a company that only offered five days of paid parental leave, um, Mm. which was also pretty tough. So we had planned to take like a full two weeks. I would take the full two weeks and he would take one week. But I remember having the baby. He came really quickly for a first baby, which was surprising. And then we left the hospital like a day early even because everything was like generally healthy and fine. Mm. But I remember leaving the hospital and just feeling so unprepared and being so surprised that they were just going to let me walk out the doors with the baby. And it felt like when I was 16 and got my driver's license for the first time, they were like, okay, you passed your test, go (laughs) park the car and come back in. And I was like, wait, you want me to park the car by myself? I've never (laughs) been in a car by myself before. This is terrifying. And that's exactly how I felt bringing a baby home for the first time. Like now what do I do? So yeah, I'd I'd planned everything up until that point. But then when I got home, there was no plan. What were some things for you in those first two weeks, first month that really were kind of surprising that you had wished you had planned for? Yeah, I feel like that memory of the first two weeks is like seared into my brain because it was so Mm. intense. It was, you know, incredibly joyful, but also incredibly stressful. And Mm -hmm. I was super hormonal, crying for no reason really stressed, sweating all the time because you build, you build up so much fluid that you then have to release at some point. And so they call it like your own private summer. 
um, like sweating through sheets and stuff every night. I didn't know like when I was going to be able to take my next shower, much less like figure out my, my grad school classes that were starting to like come back in session. Um, and then just like figuring out dinner plans, like we'd stocked up some food, but, and friends brought some over and family brought some over, but it was still just a balance of trying to figure out everyone's needs at every hour of the day. My son had some latching difficulties. So breastfeeding was a challenge for the first few weeks. And it really took us maybe like a full month to get into the swing of things. And then just the lack of sleep, I was getting like two hours of uninterrupted sleep every night, which is not enough. I remember we live on campus at um, a school where my husband teaches and we've had a lot of visitors come through to meet the baby. This is all pre COVID when it was like, you know, pr- like fairly reasonable to have um, people come yeah. <laughs> to meet the baby. Um, and it was like maybe our third round of, of guests coming through. And I was like, I just lost my mind. I, I couldn't figure out like clothes to wear that I felt good in. The baby was like, you know, hungry and tired and crying all at once. And then I just started sobbing. I had to like leave the baby with my partner and then just go. I just couldn't even say hello to the people who wanted to, you know, like bring books and were like being so sweet and lovely with flowers and everything. But I was like, I just can't muster up the, the energy to, to entertain. And it wasn't even about entertaining, but that was where I was in my head where I was like, I have to like perform and be the perfect mother and, and partner. And, you know, Yeah. And it's like, it sounds as though it's these conflicting emotions because you do want to share the unbelievable human that you just created with the world and with people that love the baby and you so much. But at the same time, you're going through all these other conflicted emotions and, and overwhelm and hormonal changes. And what I've discovered in my research is that it seems as though there's three stages of this postpartum that we need to address and plan for or prepare for that seemed to me, it outlined for me to be the first few days, those first three, five days at home. Then that time period where support leaves, whether it's doula, friends, family, et cetera. And then there's the other transition when maybe you go back to work or maybe your partner goes back to work or, you know, different changes like that. So it kind of breaks up for me into these three different areas. And in an unbelievable article that you wrote that will be linked to this episode in the show notes, so make sure you read this afterward. Um, it's You wrote it for Motherly, and it's entitled, A Postpartum Plan is Just as Important as a Birth Plan. And so in this article, you, you mentioned questions that we really should address, like, can your in-laws come and stay? Or will your partner handle the night feedings? Um, is there someone who can bring over a hot meal? And this postpartum phase really is, is a time that you have had a personal rebirth as yourself as a woman and now as a mother. And so what is the importance of that postpartum plan that we often tend to overlook? Yeah, it's exactly right. It's a sacred time. It's your personal rebirth. And women, postpartum women, women are much more susceptible to nutritional depletions like anemia, but also fatigue, of course, also osteopenia, depression, anxiety. So many things can crop up during this period that tend to get swept under the rug because we just assume it's part of the process, but it really doesn't have to be. And studies have shown that if you have more social support during postpartum, if you have paid leave, you're much less likely to be affected by mental health issues like anxiety and postpartum depression. There's also a new condition that's been named recently called postpartum stress syndrome, which is Mm. on a tier of postpartum stress syndrome, then postpartum anxiety, then postpartum depression, but it all plays into it. And the stats on postpartum depression as a general term are like one in eight women, maybe as many as one in five women experience signs of that condition. So creating a postpartum plan, I think, is just of the utmost importance because it gives you something to kind of wrap your head around when everything else feels so not real. You're like, I'm I'm pregnant and I'm having a baby and you can't really fathom any of that until the baby arrives and, and is in your arms. But trying to craft out what your life is look, going to look like on paper can be really helpful, I think, in envisioning that new, that time of change. Now, in this article, you define a postpartum plan as an outline of the nutrition, support, and self-care needs of the mother during the first 40 days of postpartum. And of course, we know that postpartum can last forever and does last years and years. You're yes. currently postpartum, even though your <laughs> child is older now, right. but it lasts forever. But those first 40 days are so key 
we will go into breaking down kind of the eight actual plans. But if you were to do it all over again, what plans would you put into place? I think I didn't have a postpartum doula lined up and I would definitely do that were I to have another baby because it just, it felt like a luxury that I didn't really need at that time. But now I just realized how vital it is to have not just a family member or an in-law or a friend come over, but someone who's like totally third party, won't judge you for your like pile of laundry in the corner, can like hold the baby with, you know, utmost care, knows exactly what you need, knows exactly what the baby needs. But it's a person not there to focus only on the baby, but someone to focus on your healing and health too. Now with that though, because I know the question going through many women's minds right now who are listening and even my own is like, yeah, but my friend will be there. Or yeah, but my mom will be there. That'll be enough. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you think that you need a postpartum doula, but when you bring it up to your partner or to a family member, they might judge it or question it. So you mentioned, you know, maybe they're non judgmental and that sort of thing. But what really is the key difference? Why is it so important? I think it's having that person there who is so focused on you instead of the baby who centers the mother experience more. Because as soon as the baby is born in the hospital, your midwife or your OB is focused on getting the baby out and is focused right. on, you know, checking the baby for health signs and vital signs and all of that information. And the mother doesn't have a postpartum checkup until six weeks later. It's it's so paltry in comparison to the baby has like, you know, four to five checkups before that point. So having a postpartum doula, I think, is like having a midwife visit or an OB visit way before that six weeks checkup. They're going to be there to check on your mental health, but they're also going to be there to check on your physical health, which is so much Mm -hmm. more, I think, than just your mom or your friend can do. And yes, the mom and friend will be super, you know, like warm and welcoming and and happy to help and full laundry and, and cook and hold the baby and all of that too. But I think it goes deeper to really telling someone else to tell you to rest, which I really needed. Um, Mm. Because, you know, when your mom comes over, you're like, I'll clean, I'll tidy and I'll like, you know, have something to serve or we put this pressure on ourselves or maybe it's just me, but no, I think we all do. Yeah, (laughs) we all do. At least to a certain extent. Yeah. So having that person there that has no expectations for that kind of level of service or even engagement, I think is really nice. So I like homework like you. I like to-do lists. I like logical, practical. So how do we actually create this postpartum plan? We can we can talk about it and everything else, but how do we put it onto paper? I noticed in this article you have eight steps outlined. So if you can kind of give us ideas of how we can navigate and really formulate this plan so that it's something that not only we think about, but also our partner and all of our birthing team is a part of. Definitely. I think it's really important to think about it the way that you would a birth plan, which most midwives and OBs ask for um, in the later stages of your third trimester. So they know what you want as well. So dedicate a weekend to creating that with your partner, with your family. Have those conversations early on to talk about things like planning for parental leave and care for you and care for the infant, planning for rest and healing planning for visitors, planning for feeding, how you're going to feed your infant, whether that's breastfeeding or bottle feeding support, planning for home support as well. If you need someone to help with the cooking or cleaning, taking that step now, planning for the new rituals as well is really important, like baby wearing and getting outside once a day and building that into your schedule. Um, Mental health support too, asking your partner or friends to check in on you regularly because you might not be in a headspace where you can notice things that you might be doing about your or ways you're going about your day. And then finally planning a return to work if that's in the cards for you. If we say, okay, this is going to be our weekend to talk about our postpartum plan, right? And kind of going through these eight steps of really figuring out what our preferences are just as we would a birth plan. So parental leave, meaning who's going to be home, who has to go back to work when the timing of that lasts, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think it's important to do your research, compare schedules, look at calendars, figure out what your company paid leave policies are, if they exist, figure out what government paid leave policies are, if they exist. I know the FMLA is there now that can support working families, but also in the Build Back Better agenda, Biden is pushing for four weeks of paid leave, which is wonderful. It hasn't been passed yet. 
um, but Cross hopefully, our fingers. <laughs> yes. um, and then talking to friends and seeing what they would have done differently, friends with kids, um, and right. asking around for advice too, because a lot of people I'm sure would be willing to share what worked and what didn't work. Now, when I look at the number two, planning for rest and healing, I actually just the other day had a conversation with an expecting mama friend and she actually told me that when she was talking to her partner about the support that she would need afterward and everything, that the partner said, well, you'll be fine. You'll be able to manage this and that or whatever. And that's not putting anything on the partner, but that's just saying, I think oftentimes women especially tend to take on that superhero role. You know, we can get it all done. I know I do it. And to be honest, if I'm, if I'm very honest, I pride myself on that. I pride myself on the fact that I get so much done in such little time and I juggle it all, right? But what is the actual importance? I mean, this rest and healing period, it, you know, in other countries, it's so common. You give birth and then you just lay there and and that's all you're supposed to do is lay there and heal. But how can we, well, first acknowledge personally, but then express to our partners and our, our support system that we really actually need to just be lifting our feet up and holding and feeding baby. Right. That should be the first and only priority at that time. It's so hard because society definitely puts that pressure on women, especially to do everything you were doing before, just with a baby attached to you, which is not feasible. It's just not possible. I also look to traditional cultures and Eastern medicine in which they practice a 40 day sitting period or a type of confinement that honors the change and the transition that women go through in childbirth, which I think is just so powerful. There's such power in taking that time for yourself and your child and and healing from the process. I know in Chinese medicine, they consider that period a time of opening and giving birth to the life. And then you're still open after. There's no closing up that happens unless you take the time to mentally and physically and emotionally and spiritually close yourself back up which is what is needed to happen. And that's why they recommend, you know, wearing socks all the time so that the heat doesn't escape your body through Mm -hmm. your feet and keeping your body warm and cared for. And they even do some binding techniques to help close the body physically. Um, Mm -hmm. Drinking warm liquids and congee and bone broth and not drinking ice water and all of that kind of stuff. Not leaving the house for that full 40 days, which can be tough when we're expected to, you know, like run to Target and pick up what we need. You know, in episode 71, I had a conversation all about the pelvic floor that was just mind blowing to me. But Kate and Kim, who were both guests on that episode, they were talking to me and comparing birth to knee surgery. And, you know, it's very common to give birth. Probably every other person that you meet has given birth. (laughs) Uh, The the stats are very up on the birth level. Yeah, exactly. But the stats on, on a knee surgery is not, I mean, I know maybe like two people that have ever had knee surgery, so it's not as common. However, the extreme intensity is, is probably even higher, I would say, with birth because it's full body as opposed yeah. to knee surgery is just one area of your body. But when we look at the recovery and compare the recovery of a knee surgery to the recovery of a birth... It's dramatically different. And why would we ever think that after we give birth, we can get up and walk and move around and do all of these household chores while lifting and carrying a a child that is probably at least 7, 10, 12 pounds? But we would never go ahead and ask someone who's just had knee surgery to get up and walk around and do chores and all of these things. It's just... It, our, our mind needs to be shifted in this sense. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I haven't heard it compared that way, but it makes so much sense. It's pretty mind blowing. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, you grow an organ, you grow a child, and then they both leave your body. The, the afterbirth was actually equally painful for me as the, as the childbirth, but it's just astonishing. And then if you have a C-section too, that is major abdominal surgery that you then have to heal for in addition to doing everything else too. It's wild. Now, moving on to to number three, planning for visitors. We really want to get specific in these details, too. And I think this is where, you know, um, just recently I released an episode about relationships and really connecting with your partner. And it's crazy because I surveyed my audience and was asking them questions about what they struggle with. And the number one thing that was in everyone's response was communication. Mm -hmm. And so... 
if we're not specific about these details, this is where the com- communication can get hairy yeah. and we can have really, you know, some struggles with not only our partner, but our family and friends. So, and especially nowadays with COVID and all yeah. of these things that we're navigating. So what are some things now that we have to really consider with, you know, the fact that there was a pandemic that just struck our world? Yeah, I think you have to be really cautious about bringing anyone into the child's world when they're under two months of age because they haven't had their first vaccines yet because they're not even eligible for that. Their immune systems are still very much developing. And the best way to protect your child is to get your vaccines yourself, get vaccinated against COVID, against flu, against Tdap, so that you can pass on those antibodies through breast milk and through other types of contact. But then asking anyone who comes to provide care for you and the baby to make sure that they show proof of vaccination, I think is of the utmost importance as well. But beyond that, it's also protecting yourself and your child from the energy that people bring into the room that you may not be equipped or prepared to handle at such a Ooh, vulnerable that's a good state. One. <laughs> you know, people struggle with all different types of family members and there's so many different types of relationships. And I think it's really helpful in that early planning stage to be honest with yourself and your partner about what you can handle in on your worst day, because that is where you'll probably be um, mm-hmm. when you're postpartum. So, you know, maybe it's not having your in-laws come to stay for the first three weeks. Maybe it's, you'll see them in a month when the baby is one and you'll send pictures and do video chats, but they don't need to come visit yet. Mm, that's so good. That that other level is something that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of, but it can really affect you even subconsciously. So how important is that? And then going back to, you know, the vaccinations and the masks and all of those things, and no matter what your view is on any of these things, I think the most important thing is just getting in line with your partner or with the support that's going to be around you and to make sure that you're on the same page so that, you know, I mean, if you don't talk about it beforehand and then all of a sudden Aunt Joe wants to come by, but Aunt Joe wasn't vaccinated. And in your mind, you wanted to only have people come by who are vaccinated. Then that's that uncomfortable, you know, conflict there. Right. Yeah. So important to have those conversations ahead of time when possible. We also know from the, the data and statistics on COVID during pregnancy and postpartum that women who are postpartum are very susceptible to severe disease from COVID too, not just during pregnancy, but up to six weeks after delivery. So mm. not letting those guards down after birth is still vital. Mm. Number four here is interesting. And I know that you said that you struggled with breastfeeding in your journey in this first 40 days. So planning for breastfeeding or for bottle feeding and the support around that, what did that look like for you? And how could you maybe have changed your perspective or planned for that better? I really was lucky because I had a pediatrician who had a lactation consultant in the office. So when I was able to bring in my newborn for initial visits, the the lactation consultant was there too and could help measure the baby and make sure the baby was getting enough food. And that just came as part of the service for those initial well Mm. visits. And I would definitely recommend seeking out a pediatrician who has lactation support on their team because it's so helpful for empowering new mothers in that journey. Because it's like a dance you do that you've never done before with a new partner that you've never met before. And you're both learning. It's so challenging. And those early weeks can be incredibly painful. And your nipples are raw and you're bleeding Mm. and you're not getting sleep and you get frustrated and having support there is really vital. I used a nipple shield for a while and then my son had a tongue tie. And for my second child, we knew that to look for that in the hospital and that all was taken care of in the hospital before we got home, which was so much easier. But I had also, you know, I wish I'd bought a bottle of formula, I think, home just so I could give myself that break um, to be like, I have this in the cupboard. It's there as an option if I need it. And that would have been, I think, just like a sigh of relief. One interesting tip that I heard, I I interviewed Erin Moore. She's a formula feeding expert. And we talked all about formula. And my mind was kind of blown because she was recommending, and this would be a perfect thing for your postpartum plan, um, especially in the breastfeeding, bottle feeding realm, is to go ahead during pregnancy and pick out a formula even if you're planning to breastfeed, yep. go ahead and, and make sure you're okay with that brand, with the ingredients. Do you want organic, not organic, whatever? Pick it out and actually purchase it. Yeah. 
Press that, oh, that 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 buy on Amazon. Get it delivered. Put it in your hospital bag. Take mm-hmm. it to the hospital. So that worse comes to worse, if you're struggling or if something happens to baby and you're separated, you've already made a choice with a formula that you are comfortable and confident with. Yeah. Isn't that such a cool That's idea incredible. that I was like, yes. Yeah, nobody talks about that, but that is such an important tip. I love that. That's yeah. really smart. Some people might have heard that episode before, but if you didn't, I think that's a really good point to add into this this plan as you're going through. Yeah, um, number six, you have planning for rituals. And so rituals, you kind of touched on these, but what are these kind of things? I mean, are we talking about even just taking a shower alone? Like what are these yeah. new rituals that might happen? <laughs> I think it's just like reimagining your, your life with a tiny helpless infant next to you or attached to your boob at all times. Um, so it's like, yeah, bringing the baby <laughs> bouncer into the, sh- into the bathroom with you so that you can take a shower or finding the time maybe you switch to night showers if you're a morning shower person so that your partner can be there or maybe even carve out time to take a bath at night or take a bath with your child, which can be really beautiful too. But Mm. You know, if you want some solo time, it's also okay to take a bath by yourself. (laughs) Baby wearing has such great benefits for not only continuing the breastfeeding journey, but promoting skin to skin contact and general closeness and um, making sure baby isn't like laying down in one position to get like head structure appropriately forming. And so trying to set yourself up for success in those rituals that might be important to you. So that means probably doing some research beforehand when you have the time and interest and talking to other moms about what they did that worked and and outlining those. I know I needed like a structured carrier for baby wearing and also a soft carrier so that I could have both options for longer walks or for just doing things around the house and having mm-hmm. those at the at the ready was really helpful. Something that comes up for me too in this is kind of what would tie into our next element, which is planning for mental health support. But I think what really kind of is an interesting key with the rituals aspect is how this can feed into you as a whole person again. So maybe you have a really, you know, big importance for a ritual of working out every morning for 15 minutes alone, or maybe yes. it's a ritual of an evening walk. Um, maybe it's a once a week ritual with a walk with your partner. You know, I want to at least once a week connect all three of us together, you know, um, or meal time or, or whatever it is. And, and I think that can all feed into your mental state in this postpartum phase. Yeah, that's really wise. It's it's planning your non-negotiables and, and making sure that you can right. keep those up even after baby is here. Yeah, and also probably the non-negotiables of your partner too. Like what do yeah. they want to make sure that they have so that we carve out the time and respect that, right? Right, so true. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Number seven is is this planning for mental health support. And so, you know, we were given a lot of titles for this time, baby blues, you mentioned postpartum stress syndrome. Is that what you yeah. said it's called? Mm-hmm. Um, and then postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression. And so how can we kind of look ahead at this time and not have those names or titles or whatever worry us that we might experience that, but how can we best support ourselves for, for, for those feelings? Yeah, I think, you know, birth can be such a traumatic experience for a for a person, even if it's not a traumatic birth in the clinical sense, but because it's such a transformative, extremely challenging physical, spiritual, emotional experience, it can be super hard to process that after the fact. So I think if you can even just set up a meeting with a friend where they record you talking about your birth birth experience, if you're comfortable with that, or Hmm. set up a meeting with a therapist, or I had my acupuncturist come to my house to visit and help perform like a mother roasting ceremony on me. And we got to talk about everything, which was really wonderful. Um, So thinking about what you might be interested in, and maybe you won't even know beforehand, but leaving space for that at least. So making that marker down on your, putting that marker down on your outline, I think is the first step. And then trying to picture that in your mind before, before the day comes can be really powerful. You're going to take that space space for yourself in, in some form, even if you don't know what that is yet. You mentioned you had your acupuncturist come. Is there anyone else that you had wished or any other appointment that you had wished that you had scheduled? I wasn't seeing a therapist at that time, but I, I should have because it would just have been so helpful to have a neutral person to talk to. Um, but mm-hmm. my acupuncturist kind of doubles as my therapist in a lot of ways. So I felt like that was <laughs> that was that box was checked. Um, 
but yeah, my mom came and uh, my mother-in-law and my best friends. And so I got to talk about things with them and they, you know, saw me sob and cry and, and all of that, which is very healing. Um, but yeah, I do wish I had had a postpartum doula to help process the physical, um, changes because that was something I felt like I had to kind of go through on my own. Um, Mm which is hard, you know, stitches and pain and swelling and losing a lot of blood. Right. And understanding that maybe what you're going through physically and especially emotionally is normal and is typical. Right. Or isn't because my second birth, a piece of the right. placenta was stuck inside of my womb and I had passed it like <gasps> eight weeks later. <laughs> totally. Oh my gosh. It was horrifying. Yeah. But I kind of loved like really gross stuff like that. So it was funny, but <laughs> I have like a picture of it on my phone. Um, but yeah, one day I just passed this huge piece of my placenta and it, yeah, my, yeah. Crazy. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. But that's yeah, that I love that you said or things that aren't normal. Cause yeah, it's like you wouldn't necessarily think that that would ever happen. But then all of a sudden, yeah. this comes out of you and you're like, oh my gosh. Oh. And maybe the effect that that might have, you know, that could be hormonally, I would imagine. Yeah, and you too. it could also have gotten infected and caused, you know, a horrible yeah. bacterial infection. And it was not great. I was very lucky. But yeah, I was bleeding. Oh. I think your your lochia, as they call it, the, the afterbirth blood um, is supposed to last for four to six weeks. And I was still bleeding pretty regularly up to eight weeks. And then my body, I was cramping and I just kind of felt like something was something else was coming out. And it was. Oh, uh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So then at what point moving on to our, our final little note here for for planning for our postpartum plan? How long did you have before you had to return to work? With my first, I really stepped back into my responsibilities after that two week period, which was way too wow. soon. Um, I mean, granted, I was working from home at that time and infants tend to sleep a lot. So I was able to get some work done, but it was a lot to manage on top of just general household things and caring for myself and Mm -hmm. for him. Um, So with my second, I took, I think it was six weeks, but it was unpaid leave, which is challenging. You have to save up for that. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I would say four weeks would be the bare minimum if if we pass that four week national policy, that would be wonderful and be such a game changer because I know so many people are unable to take time off work or unable to take unpaid leave. Um, Mm. so yeah, I would say, think about, think about what's doable for you and your family and your situation, but it's also so hard to know how you'll feel about if you have the option to not return to work, whether you even want to, or whether you want to change careers or, with my second, I was actually, I felt like I was giving birth twice because I was trying to form a private practice and launch a website and a newsletter Mm. at the same time as my son was born. And, um, I knew that that was way too much to handle, but I didn't know how else to map it out and time it out. So, um, Mm. you know, setting yourself up in advance for what might be the best situation is something I would have done for myself looking back on now, like, Take it easy. Now, if we like you have no choice and we have to go back to work, but how do we, how do we like so many people reach out to me and they're one thing and they say that they need help with or support with is just like, how do I go back to work? Yeah. So any, any little tips on how you actually just make that happen? Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. I mean, I remember when I'd had to leave my child to go into an office somewhere for whatever reason, I would bring um, one of his onesies and like some baby socks and like keep them in my bag and keep them close to me so mm. that when I was like pumping, I could like smell his smell his skin. Um, oh, that's a good idea. Smell his little scent. So keeping memories and then looking at pictures on your phone while you're pumping can be really helpful too to like stimulate mm. milk production. But then also trying to see if you can scale back in your responsibilities in some way or alternate your hours. So maybe you do um, longer days. You have a day at home figuring out what is important to you and how you want to how you want to shift that. My mom always worked part time when I was growing up and I really valued the opportunity to a get her be able to see her working, but b have her home with us at some level, too. So I knew that was important to me and I wanted to try to do that as well. So. I did work part-time and mostly from home for a while. And we started to get care in the house through family and um, nannies and nanny shares here and there where we could. But yeah, it's about figuring out where your priorities lie and figuring out how you can best Mm. utilize that and make sense of that for your family, I think. Well, I love this list. I think it's so key and it really gives us some actionable steps. Uh, The link, like I mentioned before, to 
Jessica's article is going to be in the show notes. So please go ahead, schedule that weekend to connect with your partner and make this plan, go through the article step by step and just answer all these questions for yourself. It's it's just beautiful. And the way that you put it together for Motherly is just, it's so well written and so digestible, you know, especially with everything that we have going on in in our pregnancy or, or time like that as a mama in training. And so Jessica, obviously over at Motherly, you're serving as a senior health and wellness editor. You write a lot in motherhood as well too. And, and Motherly is just a fantastic place and a champion for all things motherhood. Can you just give us a little bit more of an idea of what we can find over at Motherly and your involvement with them? Yeah, of course. I am so proud to work on Motherly because I thoroughly love their mission. It's a brand that focuses on motherhood and mothers rather than the infant and child because so many people in the Western medical world and in society in general focus more on the infant once they're born and and so much less on the mother. Motherly is trying to change that and create a world in which every mother can thrive. As their health and wellness editor, I try to focus on evidence-based and research-backed information to empower moms to make the best decisions for their health and for their family's health. Um, I write a lot about COVID these days and what to know and how to (laughs) navigate that. But I also try to write about, you know, the postpartum period and the mental health effect that birth and and motherhood has on people and trying to find yourself after motherhood, which can be a challenge. How long do you think it took you to find yourself? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I think I'm still finding myself every day. It's (laughs) such a process. But journaling has really helped me and getting back into nature has really helped me. I signed my kids up for Mm like baby nature class right from the beginning, which was Mm. such a wonderful way to recenter myself and reground myself in the earth and the ecosystem, um, which sounds a little like woo -woo maybe, but it's just so No, it sounds amazing. (laughs) Yeah, it's really wonderful. And experiencing the world through their eyes too has been really beautiful. But yeah, I mean, motherhood grounded me in the moment the way nothing else had ever before either. There's, There's no past or future. There's just the here and now and whatever you're doing at that time. So I think finally realizing that has really helped me find myself again too. And, and, you know, separating out the wheat from the chaff. Absolutely beautiful. Jessica, thank you so much for all of these tips. This is going to be, I'm, I'm definitely in the future. Whenever I get pregnant, I'm going to say, okay, it's time, husband. We're going to make this, we're going to make this weekend. We're going to schedule this out. And I think, you know, you're right. We really plan for our birth preferences and what we'd like that time to be. And then we, it kind of stops. And yeah. and then we're left to the wolves, so to speak. So exactly. this is really, really, really helpful. And at least we're not and never going to be completely prepared, but at least this can help right. us a little bit more. Yeah, that's the idea. It's taking the time and saying yes to yourself in this way and making the space for it and and holding that space. Thank you so much for your time, Jess. Thank you. And this is so fun. Everyone, absolutely. Where can people find you too, minus the show notes, but where can people follow you? Yeah, my work is on Motherly, which is mother.ly, and I'm on Instagram at Jess D. Waller. Okay, mamas in training, when are you going to say yes to yourself and hold space to create your postpartum plan? Even if you're a seasoned mama, if you plan to have a second, third, fourth child, how can you create space with your partner to discuss your postpartum wishes, desires, and needs so that we can address these eight areas so that you as a family can be as well equipped as possible? Get that date on the calendar ASAP and make it fun. Order some takeout and make a date of it. In many ways, your postpartum plan could almost be more important than your birth plan because it sets the tone for the remainder of your days as a partnership and a family. And it's when you're at your most vulnerable as a woman. As you go through this time, you may need some extra support from women who've been there. And we have a place where you can get that immediately. Join us in the free Facebook community, Mamas in Training. All you have to do is click on the link in the show notes and you'll have instant access to a group of women who are in your shoes and can walk with you through this postpartum journey. We are not meant to do this alone and I can't wait to see you there. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a review on Apple Podcasts so I know how to better serve you. I'd also love for you to join our community of Mamas in Training on Facebook. You can find me at Mamas in Training on Instagram and at mamasintraining.com. 
For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together.